Hey guys, welcome back. We're getting into part three here of Mount S Matt Stoller's article, How Democrats Killed Their Populist Soul. Uh, we've been talking about, uh, we just, in part two, we were talking about how the New Deal Democrats came to power and, and used that power really effectively. And uh, in this one here, we're going to be talking about how the Watergate babies come to power. It's sort of a, a look at the, the conditions that, that lead to their, you know, election in 1975. So uh, let's get into it here. The story of why the Watergate baby spurned populism is its own intellectual journey. It started with a generation of politicians who cut uh, their teeth on college campus politics. In their youth, they saw, up close, not the perils of robber barons, but the failure of the New Deal state, most profoundly through the war in Vietnam. We were the 60s generation that didn't drop out, Bob Edgar, a U.S. representative from the class of 1975, told me. The war in Vietnam shaped their generation in two profound ways. First, it disillusioned them toward the New Deal. It was, after all, many New Dealers, including Union insiders, who nominated Hubert Humphrey in 1968 and supported a war that killed millions, including 50,000 Americans their age. And second, higher education, the province of the affluent the province of the affluent, exempted one from military service, which was an explicit distinction among classes. So, yeah, I mean, this is an important point right here, right? We are the 60s generation that didn't drop out. So there's that old there's that old line, I think it's Timothy Leary, tune, or turn on, tune in, drop out, that it sort of epitomized the 60s ethos of like, you know, turn on, drop acid, tune in, start paying attention to the world, and then drop out, you know, remove yourself from the the like crappy world and, and let's start a new one and then you know what kind of ends up happening is that the 60s you know the student movement of the 60s kind of fizzles and it turns into this like really disaffected movement in the 70s where everyone's sort of like there's no longer all these giant marches no one's dreaming of a great new world all those people have kind of just like dropped out stopped giving a shit and, and moved on to other things and you know the ones of them that didn't drop out they become these these watergate politicians these watergate baby politicians you know elected in the class of 1975 and their primary lens of seeing the world as we've said over and over again is vietnam and is vietnam i mean this is always talking about here right is vietnam and it would many of the new dealers uh i mean hubert humphrey in 1968 uh, and it was many of those new dealers who supported the war in the first place and, and kept it going for so long which caused great disdain among them uh I, I just really don't understand this, this sentence here. First, the Viet war in Vietnam shaped their generation in two profound ways. First, it disillusioned them toward the New Deal. It was, after all, many New Dealers, including Union insiders, who nominated Hubert Humphrey in 1968. And we're going to come back to that uh, down the road a little bit. And who supported a war that killed millions, including 50,000 Americans their age. And second, higher education... The province of the affluent exempted one from military service, which was an explicit distinction among classes. I don't understand how that point fits into this argument here. That that I just don't get it. The war in Vietnam shaped their generation because higher education, the province of the affluent, exempted one from military service, which was an explicit distinction among classes. Seems like that should make them pretty class focused, no? But I guess I guess maybe what it is is that we're talking you know, the people who are going into politics were the the affluent, higher educated people. And so they don't really see class as this thing that needs to be broken down. They're actually pretty chill with where they are. That's the only way I can make sense of this point is that we're looking at, you know, these Watergate babies are come from a more affluent group than the New Dealers did. And so they're not as troubled by class because it saved their life from the Vietnam War. That's how I'm making sense of that. I don't know if I'm misreading it or not, though. In 1968, there was a great debate about the future of the Democratic Party. The Ken Robert F. Kennedy sought to win the primary with a black-blue coalition of black have-nots and working-class whites. A blue-collar, right? So black have-nots and blue-collar whites. Uh, he sought continuity with the policies of protecting independent farmers, shopkeepers, and workers, all of which formed the heart of the New Deal. Yet he also wanted to end the war in Vietnam and expand racial justice. But <laughs> Kennedy's strategy to merge these ideas disappeared when he was assassinated. 
When RFK died, Democrats nominated New Deal populist and Vietnam War supporter Humphrey, which split the party between the new left youth activists and the labor influenced party regulars, leading to the turbulent 1968 National Convention. And turbulent is like underselling it a little bit. Uh, I'm probably gonna have to put the word democratic in here, but like, it's just, yeah, nope, nope, it just comes up. The 1968 Democratic National Convention uh, in, the, in Chicago, Illinois, LBJ had announced he would not seek re-election. Re the purpose of the convention was to select a new presidential nominee. Wow, crazy. The convention was held during a year of violence, political turbulence, and civil unrest, particularly riots in more than 100 cities following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. on April 4th. The convention also followed the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy on June 5th. And when was the convention? August 26th to 29th. So MLK gets assassinated on April 4th. RFK gets assassinated on June 5th, and he was kind of like, you know, the the, the front runner in this campaign. Uh, what's the Dan Rather incident? Dan Rather was grabbed by security guards and roughed up while trying to interview a Georgia delegate being escorted out of the, bu the building. Walter Cronkite turned his attention toward the area where Rather was reporting from the convention floor. Rather was grabbed by security guards after he walked towards a delegate who was being hauled out and asked him, what's your name, sir? Rather was wearing a microphone headset and was then heard on national television repeatedly saying to the guards, don't push me, take your hands off me unless you plan to arrest me. But yeah, I, what I really want is, is sort of like the violence outside. Can we get some like images here? Yeah, I mean, so like we got all of this chaos going on outside the, the Democratic National Convention, all of these massive protests. It was this huge, huge, like, you know, what did he call it? A turbulent, a turbulent convention. It was very, very, very turbulent. Uh, I guess, I don't know if you guys can see these images all that well, but a lot of crazy shit going on here. After Humphrey's loss to Nixon, Democrats formed the Commission on Party Structure and Delegate Selection, also known as the mcgovern Fraser Commission, which sought to heal and restructure the party. With the help of strategist Fred Dutton, Democrats forged a new coalition. Co With the help of strategist Fred Dutton, Democrats forged a new coalition. By quietly cutting back the influence of unions, Dutton sought to eject the white working class from the Democratic Party, which he saw as a major redoubt of traditional Americanism and of the anti-Negro, anti-youth vote. The future, he argued, lay in a coalition of African Americans, feminists, and affluent, young, college-educated whites. In 1972, George McGovern would win the Democratic nomination with this very coalition, and many of the Watergate babies entering office just three years later gleaned their first experiences in politics on his campaign. So this is this is kind of the thing, right? Dutton sought to eject the white working class from the Democratic Party because he sees them as this traditional Americanism and, and anti-Negro, anti-youth vote. They're, they're, you know... It's kind of still the way we see the white working class, but the, the point is we're making this transition, right, from these class-focused, you know, uh, keeping power, private economic power in check thing to instead this this more race-focused, you know, thing where we want, we want African-Americans, feminists, and affluent young college-educated whites instead. And that is the coalition that is going to remake the Democratic Party away from the New Deal sort of like farmers and, and you know, uh, more working class folks. Meanwhile, by 1970, both civil society and large American institutions seemed out of control. The National Guard shot anti-war protesters at Kent State, showing that the fissures over Vietnam were only getting worse. And that's, that's the other major, you know, thing that causes the end of, of like the 60s and, and all of that uh, you know stuff is Kent State and if you want to talk about you know seeing the government as the enemy and seeing state power as the enemy not only do we have all these police you know not only do you have the all the police actions in the civil rights movement then you have all the the police actions outside of you know the, the 68 convention but but towering above them I'd imagine in the minds of all of these hippie protesters is the Kent State shooting where let's get a little background on the Kent State shooting, shall we? What exactly was going on there? 
Uh, May 4th, 1970, of unarmed college students by the Ohio National Guard at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio, during a mass protest against the bombing of neutral Cambodia by United States military forces. 28 National Guard soldiers fired approximately 67 rounds over a period of 13 seconds, killing, killing four students and wounding nine others, one of whom suffered permanent paralysis. Some of the students who were shot had been protesting against the Cambodian campaign, which President Nixon announced during a television address on April 30th of that year. Other students who were shot had been walking nearby or observing the protests from a distance. Uh, and then I just kind of want to get a little background on like the actual protests. Yeah, so Richard Nixon was elected president of the United States in 68, promising to end the Vietnam War. In 69, in November, the My Lai massacre by American troops of between 347 and 504 civilians in a Vietnamese, Vietnamese village was exposed, leading to increased public opposition in the United States to the war. The nature of the draft also changed in December 69 with the first draft lottery since World War II. Eliminated deferments allowed in the prior draft process, affecting many college students and teachers. The war appeared to be winding down in 1969, so the new invasion of Cambodia angered those who believed it only exacerbated the conflict. Across the U.S., campuses erupted in protest in what time called a nationwide student strike, setting the stage for the events of early May 1970. Uh, so, during the 1966 homecoming parade at Kent State, protesters walked dressed in military paraphernalia with gas masks. In the fall of 68, Students for a Democratic Society and a campus black student organization staged a sit-in to protest police recruiters on campus, and 250 black students walked off campus in a successful amnesty bid. April 1st, 69, uh, SDS members attempted to enter the administration building with a list of demands where they clashed with police. In response, the university revoked the Kent State SDS chapter charter. A couple weeks later, a disciplinary hearing involving two of those protesters resulted in a conf confrontation between supporters and opponents. And then the highway patrol was called in and 58 people were arrested. And then on April 10th, 1970, a leader of the Youth International Party, the Yippies, spoke on campus uh, and said, the first part of the Yippie program is to kill your parents. They are the first oppressors. Two weeks after that, Bill Anthrill, an SCS member and former student, passed out fi flyers to an event in which he said he was going to napalm a dog. Uh, it turned out to be an anti-napalm teach-in. And so that is, you know, sort of setting the stage. I don't want to keep going with this, like, day-by-day -day breakdown of the lead-up. But, but it underlines the point, right, where if these, these students who are protesting against big government then get killed by government actors it really drives home this thing that government is the primary enemy right if you are one of these you know student protesters or or just like a, a young activist who wants to change things up around this time you see government as enemy number one there's vietnam there's watergate there's kent state there, there's all you know the civil rights movement and all of that shit and now the civil rights movement was sort of you know ends with a kind of a story of government sort of doing the right thing but this whole thing is really showing you state power is a problem that is the world these people are coming from uh so anyways the penn central railroad had collapsed in the largest bankruptcy in u.s history uh do we want to look into that more i don't think so Corrupt corporate executives mismanaged the nation's train system and under an outdated regulatory system. Inflation was spiraling upward, and the ongoing corporate problems of important institutions, such as Pan Am and Chrysler, were becoming more and more evident. Plus, Japanese imports began displacing American jobs. But the new political class didn't pin the blame for social and economic problems solely on Wall Street or corporate management, as populists like Patman did, but on a broader malaise. In 1974, Charlie Peters, the publisher of the hot new magazine, The Washington Monthly, wrote, Yesterday, Penn Central. Today, Pan Am. Tomorrow? The American system is in trouble, and we all know it. Inflation and a wave of corporate problems intermingled, indistinguishable from the claims of the counterculture. We've grown fat and sloppy, Peters continued. General Motors and the post office each have over 700,000 employees. One turns out lemons, the other loses packages. The old organizations, public or private, simply aren't doing the job. I'm just curious, how many employees does Walmart have today?
Walmart employs an astounding 2.1 million people. In the U.S. alone, the company employs 1.4 million people, staggering 1% of the U.S.'s 140 million working population. Damn. Uh, yeah, so they're about half the size that Walmart is today, GM in the post office. Um, so yeah, we've got this situation where, where the economy is just kind of like not working anymore right where there's inflation starting up and and all these big businesses are failing and it seems like people are blaming you know corruption and this broader malaise that that i i don't know doesn't really make sense to me to me i, I just just taking a shot in the dark at why these people were thinking it was just the fault of malaise and not like you know materialist forces uh, I, I guess it would be that, like, you know, after all of this chaos and, and upheaval from the 60s and, and the early 70s and, and, you know, the Vietnam War and just the, like, just inability to stop that, I feel like there must have just been this, this sort of checked out attitude, right? Of, like, fuck it, it doesn't matter, you know, we can't do anything, who cares about anything, everything's fucked anyways, and that everyone just sort of, like, is so tired from all of that 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 gives them this feeling of malaise but i don't know you should probably ask someone who was like there or something for that that's just my best guess at, at why they would come to that conclusion instead of you know oh this this massive boom period we enjoyed as a result of you know being the like only capitalist superpower uh the only power who's like rebuilding western europe uh, and, and is, you know, able to just impose whatever trade policy we want on the rest of the world, you know, that gave us this, like, easy money period for, like, 30 years, but it's starting to dry up, and there's starting, you know, things are starting to change around a little bit as, as other countries, you know, uh, start being stable again, and, and, no, we haven't opened up China and, and Asia yet, but, you know, as, as, as that sort of fades, this sort of, like, you can't fail economic situation fail, fades, you know, uh, things start slowing down and, and it's not just easy money all over the place. And that's, in my mind, what is actually causing the situation. Who knows who's right? To young liberal politicians, many of whom read Peters, there was simply no difference between what the government was doing in one part of the world and what corporate America was doing at home. This cynicism allowed, it seems like there would be a difference between the Vietnam War and what, what corporate America is doing at home, but whatever. This cynicism allowed the traditional Republican notion of overregulation to be introduced into a liberal-leaning group. Whether it was overregulated or mismanaged by Wall Street, Penn Central had collapsed. So what was the difference anyways? Uh, again, seems like there's a big difference between if it was overregulated or mismanaged. The idea of Wall Street posing some kind of specialized problem was dated. After all, it hadn't been banks sending young people to die in the jungle. Remember also, this is the generation that included people like Pete Stark, the congressman who jump-started his campaign by putting a peace sign on his bank. So I guess what we're saying here is that these guys are just sort of, they're really seeing government as the problem and, and you know, malaise and all these things. They think, you know, they're getting this idea of overregulation, right? That, that these corrupt regulators have, have just destroyed the power of American business and government fucking up yet another thing, right? So we got to get government out of the way so that, that business can flourish. As 1960s activists became 1970s politicians, they had to develop a political economic framework to deal with inflation and corporate failures. And this is where the young Democrats' intellectual journey took a turn. While an older, increasingly feeble generation was arguing that the problem lay in monopoly and banking power, several leading thinkers on both the right and the left provided a new explanation. Ah, uh, this, this is a good point to add to, to my materialist explanation I gave a minute ago that, like, you know... It, it, with all of these sort of, you know, can't lose economic situations where there's only, there's not much competition abroad or, or, you know, and there's so much work to be done all over the place and, you know, American government complete dominance, you build up these monopolistic, uh, you know, businesses, maybe not quite full on monopolies, but that are not really, you know, having to, to compete all that hard. And that causes the economic malaise. But let's hear what these leading thinkers on both the right and the left have to say. On the right, a finance-friendly school of libertarian intellectuals known as the Chicago School targeted Brandeisian, comp Brandeisian competition policy. Michael Jensen, a Milton Friedman-influenced financial economist, argued that our form of political democracy threatened the large corporation. 
government rules, labor power, and antitrust policies were scaring businessmen into not investing. This type of thinking became known as the capital shortage argument. A lack of investment capital caused a lack of goods and services, and thus, inflation. Inflation then destroyed more capital, worsening the shortage. The corporation, to Jensen, was property, not FDR's public trust, and inhibiting the use of that property by shareholder owners was the reason for the economic malaise. So he's saying that the government, with all their rules and you know labor power and, and all these antitrust policies, was making it too hard to be a businessman. And, and everyone's just like, I don't want to invest in business. I just want to be malaised. And so there's a shortage of capital. Uh, which is, means there's not enough stuff being made, which means prices are going up, which is just, you know, inflation, which destroys more capital and, you know, it just sort of uh, builds and builds upon itself. And he's saying, look, you know, there's no public trust to, 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 to corporations. There's no obligation to them to do the right thing. They're just supposed to make a bunch of money. And if you're stopping them from making all that money, you're, you know, har harming our economy. You're holding it back. Another Chicago school libertarian, George Stigler, argued the th a theory of regulatory capture. It wasn't Wall Street or corporate corruption that broke America's transportation system, he said. It was the incompetence of New Deal regulators themselves acting in the interests of the industries they were supposed to be regulating. Which doesn't make sense to me, that, that these regulators were corrupt, they were acting in the interests of the industries they're supposed to be regulating, which is then fucking over the industries they're supposed to be regulating? I don't understand how this argument fits together. The answer was to shield the corporation from inept regulators and deregulate. Essentially, Jensen and Stigler offered a restoration of the pre-FDR view of property rights. Can we get this guy's argument in a slightly fuller form to see if it's actually that, abs that absurd? is best known for developing the economic theory of regulation, also known as capture, which says that interest groups and other political participants will use the regulatory and coercive powers of government to shape laws and regulations in a way that is beneficial to them, to their own groups, to the interest groups and political participants. This theory is a component of the public choice field of economics, but is also deeply opposed by public choice scholars belonging to the Virginia school, such as some other guy. Stigler's most important contribution to economics was published in his landmark article, The Economics of Information. According to Friedman, Stigler essentially created a new area of study for economics. He stressed the importance of information. One should hardly have to tell academians that information, knowledge is power. Okay. And so regulatory capture is a form of government failure which occurs when a regulatory agency created to act in the public interest instead advances the commercial or political concerns of special interest groups that dominate the industry or sector it is charged with regulating. When regulatory capture occurs, the interests of firms, organizations, or political groups are prioritized over the interests of the public, leading to a net loss for society. Government agencies suffering regulatory capture are called captured agencies. So I guess what's really happening is it's not a radically different notion from, from the anti-monopoly notion, right? It's saying that when these groups get too much power, they're going to, you know, act in ways that are not beneficial to society as a whole. And that's what's causing these economic problems. But instead of it being that they, the, the companies like sort of directly go out and, and you know, like, uh, jack up prices and drive down wages and, and cause, you know, problems in that way. Uh, that what that what is happening is that they're getting control of government and then government is putting in these regulations that maybe help individual like companies but are bad for like industry and the economy as a whole. I think that's the argument coming through here. Most important architect of this intellectual counter-revolution, the one who engaged in a direct assault on traditional anti-monopoly policy, was the libertarian legal scholar Robert Bork. His book, The Antitrust Paradox, undermined the idea of competition as the purpose of antitrust laws. Monopolies, Bork believed, were generally good as long as they delivered low prices. A monopoly would only persist if it were more efficient than its competitors. If there were a company making supercharged monopoly profits, bankers would naturally invest in a competitor, thus addressing the monopoly problem without government intervention. Government intervention, in fact, could only hurt. 
damaging efficient monopolies with pointless competition and redundancy. In an era of high prices, a theory focused on price seemed reasonable, right? So he, you know, the, the big problem is inflation. Prices are going up. So he's saying, look, you know, monopolies are only bad if they contribute to this big problem of inflation, if they drive prices up. If they're keeping prices low, there can't be any problems. And so his point is that like, look, as soon as they start raising prices, bankers and, and every, you know, whoever else can afford it is going to create some competing company they're going to charge slightly less and then they're going to you know be big and then the other company is going to have to lower their prices and ultimately you know capitals will make sure prices are optimal um and so you know his argument is also that monopolies are these giant companies that can take a, a, advantage of economies of scale and become really super efficient and deliver those low prices so he's saying monopolies actually good stop breaking them up let them get big and then that's going to be met by the second argument here on the Demo on the Democratic Party's left. A series of thinkers agreed with key arguments of the key elements of the arguments made by Jensen, Stigler, and Bork. The prominent left-wing economist John Kenneth Galbraith argued that big business, or the planning system, as he called it, could in fact be a form of virtuous socialism. Their view of political economics was exactly the opposite of Patman's and the other populists. Rather than distribute power, they actively sought to concentrate it. Galbraith, for instance, cited the A&P chain store, which, rather than the political threat Patman had decried, Galbraith declared should be recognized as a vehicle for consumer rights and lower prices. His theory, which we heard about earlier, was called countervailing power. Big business was balanced by those subject to it, big government and big labor. Inserting democracy into the commercial arena itself through comp competitive markets was a charade and the last eruption of the exhausted mind. Anti-monopoly measures had never worked. They were a cul-de-sac for reformist energy, leading away from the real solution of public ownership of industry. So what, what Galbraith is arguing is a couple things. Number one, you have these competing powers. And so maybe you don't have, you know, competition within business, but business is competing with labor and government. And so that is how the whole system is kept in check. And you don't want to make sure you have all these, you know, highly competitive industries that are subject to like, you know, democratic forces because the democratic forces are a whole separate thing. You want to make business as strong as possible so that it can compete with government and, and labor. So that's one side of his argument. And then the other side of his argument is that, you know, it's kind of the same thing we were just talking about, right? Where you want these big companies that can be efficient and that, you know, that those companies can then provide, you know, consumer rights and lower prices. And is this what we bring up? I think it's going to be in, in the next Paris. So I'm going to hold off on that point. Um, yeah, I'm going to hold off on that point. For younger Democrats, the key vector for these ideas was an economist named Lester Thuro, who organized the ideas of Galbraith, Stigler, Friedman, Bork, and Jensen into one progressive-sounding package. In an influential book, The Zero-Sum Society, Thuro proposed that all government and business activities were simply zero-sum contests over resources and incomes, ignoring the arguments of New Dealers that concentration was a political problem and led to tyranny. In his analysis, anti-monopoly policy, especially in the face of corporate problems, was anachronistic and harmful. Thoreau essentially reframed Bork's ideas for a democratic audience. So he's saying basically that government business, they're just fighting over resources and that, you know, if we make government more powerful, it's taking it away from business, taking it away from, you know, the people and putting it in the hands of, of the state, which, as we know, is the worst thing in the world to these guys. And, I, you know, I think I think it was in this line here, uh, a form of virtuous socialism. I think the idea here is basically that, you know, if we have these monopolies, uh, that these giant companies that number one, you know, they can be a vector for for consumer rights and lower prices. And number two, though, is that like they can be taxed and they can generate all of this economic activity that then like gets put to work improving the lives of people. Right. So there's you know, it's kind of trickle down. It's kind of job creators. It's those ideas. Right. That that having really strong big businesses is going to be good for the American people, uh, you know because all the wealth will trickle down and and uh, and all that i don't know i mean he says public ownership of industry i don't know if he's arguing actually arguing for like nationalizing the a and p chain store but based on this idea of countervailing powers we have big government big labor and big business i can't imagine he's arguing for nationalizing the industries and, and giving them to 
big bit you know big government so i think the point is just that you know they can be taxed and and that they generate all this economic activity which is good for everyone so with key intellectuals in the democratic party increasingly agreeing with republican thought leaders on the virtues of corporate concentration the political economic debate changed drastically Henceforth, the economic leadership of the two parties would increasingly argue not over whether concentrations of wealth were threats to democracy or to the economy, but over whether concentrations of wealth would be centrally directed through the public sector or managed through the private sector. The argument is whether concentrations of wealth should be centrally directed by the government or managed privately by the companies themselves. A big government redistributionist party versus a small government libertarian party. Democrats and Republicans disagreed on the purpose of concentrated power, but everyone agreed on its inevitability. By the late 1970s, the populist Brandeisian and anti-monopoly tra tradition, protecting communities by breaking up concentrations of power, had been airbrushed out of the debate. And in doing so, America's fundamental political vision transformed from protecting citizen sovereignty to maximizing consumer welfare. So yeah, so these are these are the two sides of the argument now. There's nothing to do with like, oh, we got to keep private power in check so that we can have these strong local communities and strong, you know, small businesses. Instead, it's like, no, we need these massive businesses. And if you think about it, in this, this is like the the glo beginning of globalization, right? This is its early days. You know, there's the post-war era of like rebuilding Europe and then the development of all these globalist structures like the UN and the the IMF and the World Bank, which I think we're going to talk about in a little bit. We're beginning. We're seeing the beginning the early days of like the multinational corporation that's doing business abroad so it sort of makes sense that you would think like look we need these giant companies to you know it, it not just serve this giant country that we have and to be uh, as efficient as possible about it but also to serve this you know newly opening world market and to take advantage of that we can't have local power we need world power and so they're arguing not over whether we should have these big companies, but whether they should be sort of centrally controlled through the public sector or managed through the private sector. Big government redistributionist party versus a small government libertarian party. The Watergate babies began to coalesce around their own sense of this new intellectual economic philosophy to deal with the stagnating economy around them. Excuse me. In an early sign of where it would lead, President Jimmy Carter deregulated the trucking, banking, and airline industries with help from economist Alfred Kahn, Senator Edward Kennedy, and Kennedy's young aide, future Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. Democrats then popularized supply-side economics in a Thoreau-influenced and Democrat-authored 1980 Joint Economic Committee report, plugging in the supply side. So yeah, so now we're talking about deregulating these industries so that they can go off and gallop into, you know, as, as maximize profits and not have to worry about, like, the environment or poisoning people or any of that dumb bullshit. In 1982, journalist Randall Rothenberg noted the emergence of this new status viewpoint of economic power within the Democratic Party with an Esquire cover story, The Neoliberal Club. In that article, which later became a book, Rothenberg profiled up-and-coming Thoreau disciples like Gary Hart, Bill Bradley, Bill Clinton, Bruce Babbitt, Richard Gephardt, Michael Dukakis, Al Gore, Paul Tsongas, and Tim Wirth, as well as thinkers like Robert Reich and writers like Michael Kinsley. These were all essentially representatives of the Watergate baby generation. And it was a prescient article. Most Democratic presidential candidates for the next 25 years came from this pool of leaders. Not all Watergate babies became neoliberals, of course. There were populists of the generation like Waxman and Miller. But they operated in an intellectual environment where the libertarian and status thinkers who rejected Brandeis shaped the political economy. So yeah, I don't really want to, I mean, we could totally just spend like 30 minutes just going one by one through all of these guys' bios. Um, but yeah, Gary Hart, Gary Hart, I think is the guy who is known as, as uh, like kicking off the modern era of like scandal journalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was the front runner for the 1988 Democratic presidential nomination until he dropped out over allegations of an extramarital affair. Uh, which is like sort of, you know, because like if you think uh, think back to like the Kennedy era where it was just sort of like, you know, uh, he, everyone knew he had all these affairs, but they wouldn't be covered. And I think in, in Watergate, the ethos changes and it's more about like, you know, 
like investigative journalism and and you know making sure there's no you know like deep dark secrets in our our leaders and all of that and this sort of manifests in 1988 the democratic presidential nomination when uh gary hart loses it because he has an affair uh so yeah so that's an interesting little story there dick gephardt is definitely a name i know but i can't remember why American politician, U.S. representative from Missouri from 77 to 2005, member of the Democratic Party. He was the House Majority Leader from 1989 to 1995 and Minority Leader from 95 to 2003. Ran for the Democratic nomination for President of the United States in 1988 and 2004 uh, and was a possible vice presidential nominee in 88, 92, 2000, 2004, and 2008. Okay. Um, Bill Bradley, that name sounds really familiar too. professional basketball player yeah I, I think I think I remember looking this guy up before and and it just I, I guess he was a famous basketball guy and that's why I know his name you know, it doesn't seem to I don't think he, I remember him not actually having any major like political you know achievements that you know and then Robert Reich uh, Robert Reich I'm, I've never really known how to pronounce his name he was Clinton's labor secretary he's the like teeny tiny little guy I saw him once uh, in in DC and he's, he's just really this teeny tiny little man that's not the page I wanted I want his Wikipedia page Wow, that's a strikingly similar picture. <laughs> it's not the same picture, but a very similar picture to this one here. Guess he's got a, a look he goes for. But yeah, he was Secretary of Labor from 93 to 97 and a member of Barack Obama's Economic Transition Advisory Board. Uh, he's a cool dude. He's a little little limp for me, but you know, he, he, he's got a lot of uh, good like you know articles and, and videos and things out there talking about stuff. So yeah, so all of these guys are, are sort of like covered in this Esquire cover story, the neoliberal club in 1982, that sort of like codifies this, this new world order. Democrats and Republicans still fought. Neoliberals, while agreeing with Reagan Republicans on a basic view that the structure of corporate America should be as depoliticized and as shielded from voters as possible, still vehemently opposed Ronald Reagan on environmental policy, foreign policy, and taxes. But the very idea of competition policy, of inserting democracy into the economy, made no sense to them. Previously, voters had expected politicians to do something about everything from the price of milk to mortgage rates. Now, neoliberals express public power through financial markets. As libertarian and future Fed chairman Alan Greenspan had written a decade before, the ultimate regulator of competition in a free economy is the capital market. And this is something Matt Stoller talks about all the time these days. He, he, he you know, I, maybe not quite so much in the last couple of weeks, but uh, for a long time, he would just rant and rant and rant on Twitter about how Nancy Pelosi and, and the Democrat power structure is just terrified of using power and just doesn't think it's their job. They don't think it's their job to use all the power that they have to, you know, affect the outcomes that they want. They see themselves very much as just like referees or like, you know, tinkerers who are just like, you know, supposed to oversee this machine and just make sure it doesn't like explode, you know? They're not supposed to go in and, and use the powers of their office to like actually change stuff. You know, if you go back to, to uh, Patman, you know, getting the District of Columbia to, to uh, foreclose on all the federal, uh, federal Reserve buildings, like, no, 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 no. That's not the way Democrats operate these days. They design like, you know, a tax plan that like, you know, gives a, a 4% uh, like, uh, write off to anyone who opens, like, what was the Kamala Harris thing? Like, a, 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 a business in a minority area within three years after doing whatever, whatever. Like, that's the way Democrats think these days, right? Not what can we do? How can we use our power to, you know, make the shit we want to happen happen? But how, you know, we're going to stay out of the way. We're going to let things play out as they should. And if there's any crazy thing that happens, maybe we'll, you know, write a law that says, hey, that was bad. But we're not going to actually wield that power. That's a, a huge talking, uh, you know, like sticking point that Matt, uh, for Matt Stoller. Just curious. When did Nancy Pelosi get her start? Is she in this uh, Watergate baby generation? Or is she... Looks like she's a little more recent. First elected in 1987. So she's like 12 years after. She's, you know, a creature of the world the Watergate babies created. I mean, if this article is coming out in 82 and is sort of codifying the neoliberal club, she's elected to Congress, you know, uh, five years after that. 
so yeah so she is very much of this this world but you know she didn't create it she just you know lives in it all right. At the same time, Rothenberg noted, while they agreed with Republicans on the importance of a depoliticized economy, they also still believed in the public good. They sought an industrial policy, a never quite defined planning mechanism to direct resources in the economy through a cooperative three-way dialogue among labor, business, and government. The government, they felt, should push the United States toward a high-tech future economy via private, high-growth technology companies. So again, you know, our way to technological progress isn't ensuring competition. It's making sure we have these high growth tech companies that can get as powerful as, as possible. That's the idea they're, they're working with here. This mix of central planning and private monopoly may sound odd, but is the extra intellectual underpinning of both the Affordable Care Act and the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act. So Affordable Care Act, that's like, you know, Obamacare and all that, which, you know, instead of creating, even creating a public op option, you know, or anything like that, it just sort of uh, used... Uh, no, that's right. Uh, it just sort of used private insurance companies, you know, to and, and forced people to get private insurance, uh, you know, and, and basically created this mix of, of private, you know, creating mix of central planning and private monopoly. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act, I don't know as much about. See, overhauled financial regulation in the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2007-2008 made changes affecting all federal financial regulatory agencies and almost every part of the nation's financial services industry. Uh, do -do. Sweeping overhaul of the financial regulatory system. What did it actually do, though? Reorganize the financial regulatory system, eliminating, eliminating the Office of Thrift Supervision, assigning new responsibilities to agencies like the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporations, the FDIC, and creating new agencies like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, CFPB was charged with protecting consumers against abuses related to credit cards, mortgages, and other financial products. Also created the Financial Stability Oversight Council and the Office of Financial Research to identify threats to the financial stability of the United States and gave the Federal Reserve new powers to regulate systemically important institutions. So I guess this is really the key, right? Rather than breaking up the, the systemically important institutions, rather than getting rid of this notion of like too big to fail, it's just like, yeah, we'll just, you know, give you a little more power to regulate these private monopolies. It's central planning for private monopolies. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, there's a couple other things in there, but I think that gets at the heart of what he's talking about here. Although the details of both policies are influenced by a certain amount of happenstance and political give and take, both policies deliver social benefits through heavily concentrated private actors, which could be seen as a private form of central planning. And both laws went through committees chaired by members first elected in 1974. So yes, we got the Affordable Care Act, which is, you know, delivering health care through like these private insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies, doesn't nationalize them at all, doesn't, you know, create a, a public health care system. Instead, it's just, you know, central planning of private uh, monopoly. And the Dodd-Frank Act, you know, doesn't break up the banks, doesn't try to create local banks or, you know, local uh, capital power. It's just like you were going to have all of banking still be done by these private monopolies. We're just going to regulate them a little bit more. We're going to have some central planning of them. Regulatory experts organize key elements of social justice, like environmental rules, consumer protection, stability mandates, product design, and diversity directives, in this progressive framework. Faith in technocrats, the revolving door in privatization, all flowed from a belief in this basic structure to deliver social justice, right? So their argument is, you know, don't break up the companies that are, are, you know, poisoning the environment or doing bad stuff to consumers or, or making, you know, stuff unstable or creating bad products or, you know, hiring only white straight people or whatever. Don't break them up. Just like, you know, pass laws that say that these private companies have to do these, you know, things that we want done. And that's where, you know, faith in technocrats, this idea that we need to just get, it's like the Obama presidency, right? Where it's just like we're going to get the smartest people together and, and they're going to figure out the way to fix everything. And the way we're going to do that is through this revolving door where we just have like, you know, the, the leaders of industries come into government to regulate those industries. And we're going to make sure everything stays privatized and all that. All of that comes from this belief in, you know, central planning of private monopolies. 
In their first five years, the 1975 class of Democrats categorically realigned American politics, ridding their party of its traditional commitments. They released monopoly power by relaxing antitrust laws, eliminating rules against financial concentration, and lifting price regulations. When Reagan came into office, one of his most extreme acts was to eliminate the New Deal anti-monopoly framework. He continued Carter's deregulation of finance, but Reagan also stopped a major antitrust case against IBM and adopted Bork's view of antitrust as policy. The result was a massive merger boom and massive concentration in the private sector. The success of the Watergate baby worldview over the old populace can be seen in what did not happen in response to this quiet yet extraordinarily radical revolution. There was no fight to block Reagan's antitrust restructuring. He reversed the single most important New Deal policy to constrain concentrations of economic and political power, and nothing. Antitrust was forgotten because no one was left to fight for it. So yeah, so this is sort of the end. This is this is the culmination of the of the the Watergate baby vision or the realization of their vision is you know we're gonna have we're instead of keeping private power in check we're gonna unleash it on the world but you know it, it, it works for us so everything's gonna be perfectly fine and you know there's they've their takeover of government is so complete that there is no significant pushback against them and you know that is that is the world that they have ushered in so that's gonna do it for this section that's gonna do it for this video uh, I'll be back in the next one. Looks like we're going to be talking about Bill Clinton, but I actually am not quite sure what the next one's going to be. So, you know, click through to it. Give it a watch. I'll see you there in just a little bit. Take it easy, guys. Goodbye.